and welcome to My Baking Journey, a podcast for bakers where you get to hear from some of the great minds in the baking industry. My name is Haf. And my name is Rachel. I'm a baker. I know what it's like to be baking all day alone in my kitchen, experiencing the frustrations and struggles with no one else to guide or support me through it. And I'm not a baker. But I've witnessed all the ups and downs that come with this industry and where it's hard to get a little bit of extra help. So if you're looking for advice, tips, and amazing insight from various experienced bakers, you've come to the right place. So let's give you a little insight into what's in store for you this week. I'm just trying to find the balance between how do you not go stale staying in one spot but not move so fast that you don't give it a chance to mature. I would do something and I'll see a little bit of success and for some reason I self-sabotage and I'd stop it. I had pretty staff, but even that I winged it. Like I didn't do proper interviews. Literally, I'm like, come in, I'll see if I like your vibe. Okay, I like you. Come in tomorrow, I'll show you what to do. But yeah, like even with staff, it was wild. (laughs) I hit burnout every year, like every Christmas I take three months off. And I guess if you go through my Instagram posts, you'll see around December to February, I do not, I don't post because I'm off. Yeah, I'm exhausted by the end of it. In hindsight, because I've reflected on it, I might make it sound like it's not a good thing, but it was amazing being able to do all those things. Even when I was struggling I was really enjoying it. It's only because I couldn't cope with all of them at once that I had to let them go. And I guess my ability to just let things go then allowed me to pivot so many times so that I could still have a business now. But for me, in terms of my purpose, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Today, we have an open and honest discussion about choosing your right path and making sure you're happy doing it. We're speaking today with Tap, who is the brain behind the brand Don't Tell Charles from Melbourne, Australia. If you've ever created a concrete cake, you can thank Tao for that because she was the first one to do it. Tao has taught thousands through her cake school, but it didn't start that way. It started a long time before that. And going against the goals of her family expectations, she went and decided her own path. She started a cafe. She went through loads of changes into a baking school and many other things to get her to where she is today. But it's taught her so much about herself and the journey that she's gone through to teach many others in all manner of skills. Of course, it's not just baking, is it? It's business ownership. It's teaching entrepreneurship. But it, most importantly, it's inspiring others to go forward and make a path for themselves. I personally love this chat because Tao beautifully opens up about the ups and downs of it all. And through this discussion, she has the positivity and the determination to continue and succeed no matter where life takes her. For those of you who are constantly questioning what you're doing in life, and if it's the right path, just sit back and have a listen. We think you'll get a lot out of this one. Enjoy. How are you guys? Doing all right. We're ready for some warm weather there, I'll tell you what, that's for sure. But no, we're really good. And it's just really nice to finally pin you down and sit down with you to talk. I know. I'm so sorry. It's just been a bit crazy. That's not abnormal for you. It sounds like the last 10 years of your life have been pretty much crazy. It's been pretty weird because since having Stevie, so I haven't traveled for four years. Before that, that was the norm. But I haven't travelled for four years. I squeezed in going to see my family in Vietnam and then we went to Bangkok for a few days and then we came here and then we're going to go back to Ho Chi Minh for a few days. So I think we just try and squeeze in the last four years (laughs) worth of travelling in this one trip. It's pretty good though. I mean, nothing like a child to sort of reset your position in life and what you're doing and what you're thinking. I question everything. (laughs) I question everything. Who I am, what am I doing? (laughs) Yeah, it's like being an entrepreneur on steroids in a certain sense because you do. it does just make you stop and reevaluate everything you're at. But I think what's interesting for us about understanding you is you are someone who questions and reevaluates the norms as it is. I mean, it seems like the history of 
what you've been doing as a cake maker and a cake designer has always been questioning and challenging what's been normal. But I would even argue, probably going before that, you must have had some kind of, not necessarily inspiration to do that, but some kind of thinking around why does it have to be that way? But I don't know where that came from for you. Can you pinpoint it? Do you want the long answer or the short answer? I oh, whatever you feel comfortable sharing. It's all right. So my mum passed away when I was eight. Okay. And then I moved to Australia when I was 12. From Vietnam. So I think I'm just used to change throughout the years until I met Chris, my husband, that I've actually stopped and realised that's been my coping mechanism in a way, in that I'm really comfortable with change. And as soon as I'm, I'm uncomfortable with something, because I know I can go and start something else, I just go, okay, I'll start. So I think some of that is my coping mechanism of all the stuff that's happened when I was little. So my dad still lives in Vietnam. So I left him when I was 12 to come live in Australia with my grandma. And that's a trait since having my daughter, Stevie. It's been making me reflect a lot. And then I've stayed in one spot for so long that right now I'm just at a point where I'm just like, okay, what's a good balance between me acting instinctively, which is to just question things all the time and change. And I get here and I can't be comfortable at this point. I have to make something different. I have to do something new. So what's the balance between me doing that and not doing that at all? But I guess, yeah, back to your question, it comes from so many changes happening in my life so early on. And that's just how I've coped with it. Do you think then going back to you were never trained or went to school to work in food. You, From what I understand, there was journalism, there was landscape gardening. We're talking very different paths that you were going down. Was this out of... And it's hard to describe it. Did it feel like that was the most comfortable thing to do, the right thing at that time? But then you get to a point where you just you feel like you're uncomfortable now. No, I'm going to go do something else. It's just such an interesting background. We're just trying to figure yeah, out, like, yeah. how did it get to where you are now? So my dad is a musician and he's always been his whole life. So he's a guitarist and he teaches guitar now and he's in his 60s. But my mum was also in a band, but she was a dressmaker. So I grew up in a very creative family. And back in Vietnam, we have an extended family and everyone's really musical. So I always grew up in that environment. When we went to Vietnam like a few weeks ago, every get together, there's like bongos and guitars and singing. <laughs> and that's my family environment. But because my mum died when I was eight and then I left my dad when I was 12, I have never had a chance. I guess if my parents were still around and I grew up in that environment, I would probably pursue music. Sure. But then coming to Australia and being raised by my grandma and my auntie and they were a bit more traditionally Asian in the way that they like to study. And so I guess being that young, I'm innately creative, but I also, I am quite good academically. So trying journalism and landscape architecture, that was just me finding myself in a way. Okay. And then I just started making cakes as a way of Cooking, another thing, cooking. My family, because there's so many aunties and my grandma, and I always grew up with, around that culture of cooking from scratch. And I didn't cook until I moved out of home when I was 22. And that's when I realized, oh, shit, I could cook. <laughs> but I've never actually cooked up until that point. But all that knowledge and all that kind of just helping everyone prep, somehow it just stuck. And I knew what flavors went well with what, but no one's ever sat me down and gave me a lesson on that. I guess it's just part of the way that I grew up. Yeah, but it's quite different though, Tao. I'm guessing you cooked a lot of savory dishes when I think about Vietnamese cuisine. Yeah, yeah. So where did the sweet side of it come from? So my ex-husband, so I'm, I've been married once before, he used to go on this diet. I think, oh yeah, it's very popular now, but it's intermittent fasting. So he'd have a cheat day where he'd eat good all week and then he'll just have one day where he'll just eat whatever he wants. And he ate a lot. So um, lots of sweets and whatever. Then I'm like, we can't afford to buy the amount of stuff that you eat on your cheat day. So I'll start making you cupcakes or whatever. And I guess that's pretty much how I got into it. I'm still questioning that till this day. Like, why do people 
love baking so much because it's such a shit thing sometimes. Especially I see so many of our students and you, Rachel, you told me everyone's trying to juggle so many things, yet they choose something that labor intense as a way to somehow feel happy. It's quite a creative outlet though, when I think about it, because you're taking all these ingredients and when I started off anyway, <clears throat> you're taking all these ingredients and you create something. It's magical and then you can eat it. Yeah. So it's that feeling of achievement at the end that really hooks you. Years down the path, you're like, oh, the baking process is not as fun as the decorating, the creative process. But yeah. it all started as a journey where it is very creative. I see that through like my daughter and son, if we make stuff now. Like for them, it's quite magical making a cupcake. And then it comes out of the oven and oh, Yeah, and then they can eat it immediately. (laughs) So they get that immediate satisfaction. Whereas I think for bakers, because we do it day in, day out, it's quite, oh, it's just another batch of red velvet or (laughs) chocolate or something. But maybe it was like a creative outlet for you because if you were in journalism and landscape, architecture is very creative in some ways as well. But maybe it was just an immediate creative outlet of something just... Yeah, I liked that I could use my hands. The things that I studied, I didn't like at the time, but it's helped me a lot in my business now. Like even with landscape architecture, learning how to use the Adobe Suite and Photoshop and Illustrator and learning the basics of design. And that's helped me a lot in terms of cake design. But when I started, it was purely that joy that we just spoke about, like putting something together and it worked and you feel that sense of achievement straight away and then you give it to someone and they eat it and they're happy. I think that's the draw card at the start. That must be because I feel like the two of you, I'm picking up from you, Tao, some elements of where you can quickly master something and you want to move on. Yeah. And then that's the part that gets harder is keeping it interesting and motivating and keeping that desire to say, okay, I've mastered this piece. Now what can I go do next? But then trying to do that within the realm of baking yes. pushes you then to hit find those new things. But you maybe you do that in other ways. Obviously, you started a coffee and cake shop with your ex-husband. And that was a shift in your it wasn't really a career yet because you were still studying at that point. Is that correct? Yeah. See, so my dad, I, I can't remember how old I was. But it was pretty early on, maybe in my early 20s or even in my, I was 18 or whatnot. I had a conversation with him and he said, one thing I regret in life is I didn't stay in one spot for too long. So I've got that ability like you said, to master something really quickly. Like I'm a really quick learner and, you know, I can master all the basics, but then when you hit that point where you need to stick it out to to actually master it, that's when I go, now I'm going to go and try something new. So my dad said <laughs> to me, Rachel, same. <laughs> yeah, so my dad said to me, that's my biggest regret in life because when I was young, I was better than most of my classmates. And at this age, they're all more established than me because they stuck to one thing, whereas I've changed, I don't know how many times my dad's changed what he's been doing. Like He's always had the music, but business-wise or career, he's changed a lot. So mm. that really stuck with me. And it's something that I then recognised that I, I did a lot. Like I did journalism and I didn't finish it because I didn't like it. Yeah, And it was on a full scholarship, like everything paid for. And even then I was like, nah don't like it, don't care. And then I did landscape architecture and that's when I met my now husband, Chris, but I didn't like that either. Stuff it, move on. Yeah, so I'm really quick to just move on to things. So then, like I said before, when I had Stevie, I really had to stop myself, really just stay in one spot. So now I'm like at that point, like you said, where I'm just trying to find the balance between how do you not go stale staying in one spot but not move so fast that you don't give it a chance to mature. I think it's probably your personality type. I think because you're quite an innovator and an innovator is not very, always very good at creative at following through and keeping momentum. And I don't think that's a downfall. I think you're, you create so many amazing pillars in your business because you won't sit still. 
your balance probably for you is finding someone who can complement and keep the other arms of the business going so you go out and create because it's hard sometimes if you've got a personality type like that to be able to follow through and you can do it once twice but after that you're bored yeah but it there's lots of different personality types so it's finding that balance of in your business of someone who can complement that that's my struggle rather than changing yourself because it's a really hard thing to do yeah i resonate with you because I see a lot of myself in you in that kind of way. And I think I've just come at peace with myself. That's just my personality type. And I need someone like half to balance me out. And two kids here as well that are only going to... You're very lucky to have, as you know, I've had a, a husband who I had a business with and I just, I don't know, maybe it's unfair on people, but anyone who things of starting a business with their partner. I'm like, do not do that. (laughs) One, don't start a cafe. Two, don't work with your partner. (laughs) Let's go back and talk about how it went from baking on a Sunday or your ex-husband's cheat day to then turn into a coffee shop. Because I find this story really interesting because I know there'll be lots of people listening, tuning into this going, Oh, hold on. At what point did she decide to go, I'm going to open a cafe? Because it's a really brave decision as well. I guess that's the thing, especially when I was young, like I acted very instinctively. And as soon as I make a decision, I just think that it, it, I can do it. I say I wing a lot of things and winging to people might be a disaster, but that's how I would describe how I do things. So my ex-husband, we weren't married at the time, but he was working like in the contract position. So it wasn't stable. I was working for a family business, managing owners' corporations, so like apartment buildings and stuff like that. It was like really dry work and I was 24. So this is like a facilities manager for a bunch of yeah, flats? And yeah, yeah. Okay. And that was just coming off the back of leaving landscape architecture and I just didn't want to... I've left two courses already. I didn't want to just jump into another degree just for the sake of it. So I'm just doing whatever job. And so, yeah, we were kind of just like, what can we do that I'm not dependent on other people? If Actually, now that you ask, it was meant to be for him. He's had a really good palate and he was into like coffee and cigars and just wine and just really into that stuff. So I'm like, what can we do that you can do? that it's more stable. So initially we were like, oh, just do a coffee van, drive to whatever. And then that somehow turned into the cafe. And that this is another thing that I tend to do, I take over. Like group projects in school, it's always somehow I would be telling people, this is what you do. I haven't thought about this in a long time. But yeah, so initially it was meant to be a coffee thing. And then it was like, because I was already baking for him, we were like, well, got to sell something at the cafe and I knew food was not something I wanted to sell because there's a lot of work in it. So I was like, I'll do the cakes. And it wasn't even cakes then, it was macarons and cupcakes. Okay. And where Don't Tell Charles was, the rent was really cheap because we knew the owner and that used to be a restaurant. So they had everything already in there. We got a loan just to get it going. But if I was to start a cake shop now, and do it the way that I want, it'd be hundreds of thousands. Whereas back then, I think it was like our debt was like 50,000 just to get it started. And when you're young and you don't really have any concept of money, if you can get a loan, you get a loan. You don't really think much about it then. You're winging it. You're just winging it. Yeah, and my thought was that if I go back to school and do a degree, it would cost me that much anyway. And what do I learn? Nothing. I thought I didn't learn much in the two degrees that I did. So. I thought, you know, if it doesn't work out, then I would see that as my degree in business. At least I get hands-on experience. And that's literally as far as we thought. I think this is why it was hard for my ex-husband as well, because I was so fast and I kept, I was fearless and I was just like, let's open a cafe. cafe." And then Then we opened a cafe. (laughs) Yeah, Because a lot of people talk about these things. And But actually, it's hard sometimes to pull the trigger and just go, I'm going to go do it. Yeah, I didn't have any of that. It's just like that. And that's how I've been. And then that's why I struggle so much now, because since having Stevie, 
all these fears and like kind of doubts and stuff just I'm like, who is this? Why am I worried about so many things and you're assessing situations and you overthink things? And I've never been like that. So now it's a challenge for me. But back then, honestly, it wasn't that much of a probably like half an hour conversation. And Let's do it. Yeah. So we actually took a trip to Vietnam and we thought, ah, oh, obviously my idea and he just went along with it. So we went to Vietnam, we got business cards made, signage, because I knew where all of that was. And so then that justified the trip because it's so cheap over there. We made our own furniture out of crates. And I don't know, now that you're asking, yeah, I just did it. But now anyone that tells me, oh, my dream is to open a cafe and sell my cakes. Oh, my God. <laughs> but we should there. set the scene by saying 2013, I think it was that you opened it. The coffee scene in Melbourne, I mean, half lived down in Melbourne. It was yeah. really... I was like, mad. Thousands of coffees a week you can easily pull yeah. if you're in the right spot. Good foot traffic. This didn't matter, it seemed like. Although, I say this, but apparently the first day you opened, you didn't have a single customer? Because it wasn't the right spot. <laughs> See, I told you I didn't think about it. It's only because this place was so cheap and I knew the owner. So it used to be a follow... It's an, at the bottom of an apartment building. And it used to be busy, but then because it's like a thoroughfare, they blocked it off. So it's like a no through road. So there's literally, unless you live in that apartment building, you wouldn't have any reason to come out. Right. So when we open, the weekends would be busy because people in that pocket who live there, they know we're there. So they just come out in the morning, but we'd be busy with two hours and that's it on the weekend. But during the week, it's pretty yeah, it's pretty quiet. There's no passive buy or anything. Just pretty much people from the building. I'm telling you, I didn't, there's no plan, business plan, projection. <laughs> Everything was just on the fly. So I guess that's where the cakes came from as well. And you, we need more income. Like, how do we increase? Like, you can't really change the traffic unless you pour a lot of money into advertising. But even then, like, mm. how many can you attract into a dead end? So I guess that's where the cake orders started happening. So how did that feel? I mean, I'm just taking myself back. You would have done a load of preparation, got the shop ready, been baking through the night, the weeks before leading up, getting all the coffee beans, coffee set up, milk set up, everything ready. And then no one walks by. It's a bit of an anti-climax, really. It's, it's... No, like it was raining as well. So literally we're inside and it's raining outside. But yeah, I guess I was just young and I just, I didn't do it for money. And I was just happy that we, because it was a lot of work. Like we made our own furniture and, and this is the thing now, like you tell me to make a card and it's an effort now. But back then I'm really DIY. I love that stuff. Oh, I used to. So that was just, it's always been just like a, an experience for me. That I remember was a very nice memory. And then we cut, that was like a soft opening. So we had like a grand opening on the Saturday and then all friends and family came. So it was, I guess it never really crossed my mind that much until we were like, okay, we're not making we need to pay the any bills. money. <laughs> <laughs> so when you started adding cakes, how long was it until you realized that the coffee and cake part wasn't really working out and maybe it should just be cakes only. Was this a few years or is this just pretty quick? Everything happened. I think it happened all at once. So because we sold sweets and stuff in the cafe, so people would ask for cakes and I was selling cupcakes and macarons to order as well. Like you could order them. So of course people would then ask someone's birthday is coming up. So I would double in cakes. So I made like fondant cakes that I didn't like. So not until 2015 when buttercream cakes started getting popular and, I'm, and then I tried my hands at some of them and I'm like, oh, this, I like this. It makes sense. Kind of just happened organically. Instagram was off the charts then. Like you just post a picture and that's what I did for a while. I just make something and I post a picture and then someone else would ask and it didn't become just the cake shop until my husband and I split up. Okay. And so for a while it was the cafe and then I took orders. And then even when I started teaching the first class in Singapore, the cafe was still going. So I think in one of my blogs I mentioned that there was a weekend when 
I had to bake for the cafe, I had to bake orders and then I had to get them all ready so that I could go on the plane on the Saturday to go to Singapore. And on that Monday of that week, the oven died. (laughs) Yeah, so if you want to read disasters, you can go and read that blog. But so there was a time when all three things was happening and then when we split up, I said, um, the coffee side's always been yours and I'm not interested in managing it or taking over or anything. So that's when, when I took over, I think 2016, we shut the cafe. It's still the same site, but then I did some painting and got new tables and stuff. And yeah. I was already teaching then. That's why I turned it into the studio. So then we just did cakes and workshops. Are you saying that through the popularity of Instagram or your customers, buying your cakes, people started asking you to teach them? Yeah. Because your first class was in Singapore. It wasn't even in Australia in 2016. Yeah. So someone messaged me through Instagram asking if I was interested to come to Singapore to teach them. And this was just when I was (laughs) posting pictures of my cakes. And I had already made concrete cakes then. So my time, I can't remember the exact year. I think it would have been... 2015. You made a concrete cake that came out by accident. Yes. Yeah, so we should just say for our listeners, we are talking to basically the creator of the concrete cake and you. And this was something that was not planned. You, it just came out. You know what? Like everything that was good came out of mistakes or like running out of things and having to come up with something else to fix it. But yeah, so back then I was already making concrete cakes and stuff. So this person reached out and said, would you come to Singapore to teach me? And I said, yeah, I would, but I think it will cost you a lot of money. So why don't you find some other people who would want to learn as well? And then you can split the cost. So that's how it started. And so my first class in Singapore was in front of 10 people. I've seen the picture. Yeah. The great, it's a great black and white picture. The four, of, It's like 10 of you sitting around. It looks like someone's kitchen, tiny little kitchen. <laughs> the quality is so bad in colour. So I had to make it black and white. Oh, you made it black and white. There you go. Yeah, so the first time I taught was in front of 10 people in Singapore. Amazing. And that's quite unusual, really, because you're going into a different place, different location, different country. And for the first time, so first of all, you got to make sure, were you baking the cakes all together? Was how many ovens did you have? (laughs) So they had to provide the cakes. Okay. And I sent through a list of requirements. These are the tools we need. The room needs to be aircon. We need to have freezer space. We need to have fridge space. And But yeah, I had to get there and make a big batch of buttercream so that everyone has. That first class, everyone made their own buttercream because we had the little KitchenAids. And then I improved on that after and I requested that we have a big mixer. So then I'd do a big batch beforehand. It's a classic case of learn as you go along. Yeah. Yeah. So the next class, right, what do I need to do to improve the second class just in case someone asks? It's crazy how much I win things because the class was supposed to start at 10 and I got there and I remember sitting down at 9.30 with a piece of paper just then writing down what I'm going to go through. Just like a, an outline of... So yeah, half an hour before I started, that's when I started thinking about what to do. Hey, sorry to interrupt, but I have to ask. You know you're about to go bake a cake, right? Or maybe you're making one right now. A really nice and expensive tall cake with some beautiful decorations and maybe some dried flowers or a large topper. What are you going to box that in when you give that to the customer? Please don't tell me you're going to use extenders and staple that to a standard flimsy box and then wrap the thing in plastic and then give that to the customer hoping for the best. I have a better idea. Why don't you try... Bulba Tall Cake Boxes. They're gorgeous, strong. They come in 14 or 20 inches tall. You can easily put them together and they're perfect for your beautiful cakes. I mean, you've just spent four or five hours making this thing. Show it off in something that's going to elevate your brand to another level and then wow the customer. Check them out at www.olba.shop. That's O-L-B-A-A. All right, back to the show. There's a lot of confidence in that though, Tao, right? Like you you can do it and you're not the type of person that's necessarily worried about what if I blank out or what if I just forget or you, it, it doesn't come across your mind because you're 
your focus is in other areas, right? You just maybe the excitement of just going to teach is enough to propel you to say, oh, I don't, I don't really need to provide. I'm just going to prep it when I get there, and we're just going to go yeah. have fun. And I guess I know, I know what to say. My thing was just, I'm just going to show how I do it. Yeah, it, it was never like, how do I teach? And I did debating for a few years in high school, so that I think prepped me for public speaking a lot. Yeah. Sure. And I never froze in front of a crowd. I then froze in front of a camera for a long time, like <laughs> the camera, because we started doing online courses. And for a long time, I would not film me speaking to the camera because I just couldn't do it. But you put me in front of a room of 100 people and I'm fine. Like I get the energy from that. Sure. That's fascinating. We've actually interviewed one of your students on this podcast interestingly enough. And I only just need to say she's in Panama for you to know who she is probably. Yes. But, but I think, and I didn't, we didn't even realize that until I saw a picture, but I just, it just goes to show how something can grow and the number of students that you have is in the many thousands, right? Yeah. It's just something that starts so small and then balloons into what you can do with an online case school. But you, it's not just Singapore that you went to, right? You've been over here to London. You've obviously done courses in Australia. Yeah. When it exploded, it's crazy. And I just kept going. I didn't really stop to... I guess that's another thing. I don't know if you do this, Rachel, but because you move on so fast that you don't really care what you've achieved or it just seemed normal. Like you just go, oh, yeah, you know. Yeah, what's next? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I haven't done that with half yet. But. No, it's classic though. <laughs> it is classic though. In other areas, yeah. So, right. I'm going to pass it on to half now to take it over. And I'm going to go find the next thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you look at your achievements and you just go, oh, well, I did that. That's what I expected kind of thing. But so I've been to Auckland, London a few times, Singapore like three or four times, to Indonesia. And when I was pregnant with Stevie, I was still getting a lot of requests and stuff. But the studio in Melbourne, so the student from Panama, she flew in. Yeah. So you're talking everyone. And obviously, this was pre-COVID, flying was such such a normal thing, you know. I had people flying from USA, Thailand, France, whatever country you can think of, I've had someone flying for Melbourne. I'm going back to that time. So I started getting really interested in cakes around 2017, 18. And That's about when you, saw, when you found yeah, her, right? So I don't know if it was the Instagram algorithm because we were in Singapore that I saw a lot of Australian cake artists. So... You were up there. I remember showing half like your page. Don't touch it. You were exploding over Instagram. It was just yeah. you, Posh Little Cakes, Jenny, Magnolia Kitchen. And there's several other Australian, New Zealand cake artists that I was following at the time. But yours was so different, so unique. Each one of those artists are very unique, each one of you. But your designs, I remember showing half and he was just like, because he loves minimalist design and concrete. And I actually asked her to make me a concrete cake for yeah, one of my did. birthdays. I did. <laughs> and I made one based on yours. I feel, I tagged you. It was really early on in Singapore in the heat. But I tried to get like that lovely chocolate shard on the top where you melt the chocolate over yeah. a measuring jug and you put it in the fridge and, and then lovely wispy lines. And I just, I felt like I was, Channeling my inner Don't Tell Charles. Um, <laughs> but your designs at that time were so unusual. Cake, buttercream cakes designs were just exploding. It was this magnificent change from the old school fondant cakes into these beautifully new designs. So I am not surprised. I think I was looking into coming down to one of your workshops yeah. as well yeah. in Melbourne. But how you exploded at the time because Instagram for you must have just overnight just gone crazy. Actually, it wasn't overnight, but it was quite a gradual. This is the thing. I don't know. I'm still trying to learn this part about myself in that I I would do something and I'll see a little bit of success. And for some reason, I self-sabotage and I'd stop it. So for example, Instagram, I'd post and not reply to anyone's comment. So I don't fully get into anything. People were asking me to go to 
all sorts of places. And I'm just like, nah. Yeah, so I never really fully explode because I I guess I stopped myself. I don't know. You kind of control it from getting too crazy maybe. Maybe I was scared. Yeah. Scared of being hurt or scared of something happening or... Yeah, I don't think I was in control. I think I was just scared of just saying yes to everything. Yeah, to maybe on the outside it looked like I was exploding, but on the inside I felt like I could, that's as much as I could cope with. Yeah, an Instagram wait. You're still taking orders during that time for normal yeah. cakes and weddings. I had staff, so that was another issue that I had is not training staff properly, but then flying out and then having to get them to do orders or not take orders for that weekend at all. And they could do the cake, but then when they decorate it, that I had to let send me a picture and I'd have to mark the picture and go, <laughs> that's sale there or that's not right, make another one kind of thing. So <laughs> it wasn't efficient at all. So I guess it just got crazy. And this is another thing too, Rachel, it's that when you wing it, and you've moved so fast, you don't put in place anything to sustain the success that you get because you move so Procedures fast. Procedures or documents or... Yeah. Because that all seems really boring in your own head, right? Because it takes time to... Yeah, or like training staff properly or working out is this worth doing because the cost is more than what I'm getting paid for, like none of that. So I think it's it would be natural if anyone is willing to go at it that hard and move that fast to find success, but it won't last. And that's, I guess that's what I've learned. You were on your own at this point, right, Tao? Like you were running the whole business, don't tell yeah. Charles, on your own. You had cake orders, so you're still getting your bespoke cake orders coming in, cake classes. We'll talk on your online school as well. Uh, you're flying around the world teaching. That's an awful lot. I'm managing your social media for one person to be in charge overseeing everything in a matter of a growth span of a couple of years. So that winging it attitude that got you to where you are probably couldn't sustain that pace as well because you probably needed some an army of people behind you to help yeah. manage those bits of the business for you. It's very hard when you're on your own. I had three staff, but even that, I winged it. Like, I didn't do proper interviews. Literally, I'm like, come in, I'll see if I like your vibe. Okay, I like you. <laughs> come in tomorrow, I'll show you what to do. But yeah, like, even with staff, I just, so it was wild. <laughs> and how was that, Tal? It's just in realities, right? You're hiring in staff and you give them a quick training, show them around, and then at what point do you feel confident to leave them on their own to go off and say, oh, I've got to go to Singapore to do this workshop. Can you get these four cakes out this weekend? Or I don't know. At what it took a while, but I rarely did it. I only did it if I had to. And again, as a business, that's just crazy. Like you don't leave the place and not take orders. But that's pretty much what, what if I flew out on that weekend, I wouldn't take orders unless someone like, I had customers who really insisted and then I had to tell them my staff will be making it, not me. And then they'll go, okay, fine. We're happy with that. And a couple of times just didn't turn out right. Just didn't look like how I would do it. So then I just wouldn't do it. But it's just crazy running a business like that. How was your mental health at that stage? Because I'm thinking about if I was juggling all those types of things, it would be a lot, right? It's a lot. It's exciting. It's exhilarating. There's, it's never boring because there's lots of different things that you can put your brain into and dabble into. But did you hit burnout? Did you hit? Oh, I hit burnout every year. Like every Christmas, I take three months off. And I guess if you go through my Instagram posts, you'll see around December to February, I do not, I don't post because I'm off. Yeah, I'm exhausted by the end of it. But also 2016, at the end of it, my grandma passed away and she raised me. And that, I think that's what made me work so hard. And I realized when I stopped, that's why I, when I completely burnt out, I think 2018, 19, 
And that's when I stopped taking orders. And then when I got pregnant, I'm like, I'm not teaching physical workshops. Like I just, just didn't want to do anything. I realised because she, of the grief and, you know, I didn't really stop to grieve her passing. So I just worked even harder. So, yeah, complete burnout. And then you get to that point and nothing really matters, you know. You just go, that's another thing. I'm really good at just letting go. Yeah. And then I stop taking orders. And we still get people messaging us trying to order a cake till this day, but I just stopped taking orders because I just couldn't handle it. If you had time, you had you ran your business properly, then you wouldn't just shut it down. Like you'd retrain the staff or you'd do other things. But yeah, so I first said no to orders. And then when I was about five, six months pregnant, so October, October 19, I did the last few workshops and then since then I haven't done any other physical workshops. And again, we still get... It's exclusively online. Yeah, uh, we still get people asking. So now it's like a completely different business because the online thing was always just people not being able to fly in and just hammering my inbox every day. Do you have online course? Do you have online course? So that was always just going to be like a side thing. And then at one point I realised, hold on, I spent not even one day on this thing and it's pretty much making me more money than the cakes and the workshops. And so I'm like, if we're going to start a family, then I've got to start thinking about which direction we're going to go in because I have colleagues who bring their little children to cake deliveries because they don't have any other choice. And if you know me, I'm all about efficiency and (laughs) doing less for more. So it just didn't seem like something that I wanted to continue doing like I barely coped as a normal like a single person as it was let alone having a kid so yeah that's when we transitioned to fully online luckily before COVID but then the business was like through COVID in 2020 even 2021 it was fine and then last year 2022 things just completely shifted online so many competition algorithm change, Facebook change, the Apple change, the privacy, like it's just everything just changed. So it's like I'm the last two years I've forced myself to just stay in one spot and put in the necessary systems that will allow me to actually grow this business. (laughs) I'll just wing it because I can't really wing it anymore. But also I think having a child does mean that you have to focus more as well. So it's focusing in on I've only got so many hours a day how do I focus them to maximum efficiency to both bring in salary, but also so I can also spend time with them? There's nothing like a child that helps you do that. So I'm just wondering through, through all doing all those online courses, you put out a lot of content, a lot of content and advice and support and wisdom out to lots and lots of people around the world, right? That they can tune in, especially all your previous students that were probably already signed up to your mailing list, just ready to go. But how do you juggle that now with having that creative energy? Because you are a creative. So do you find it really hard? Do you have to sit down and work in blocks of time to produce this kind of content? Do you still need some kind of creative outlet in the background? Yeah, so it's been really hard, not only having a child, but We had Stevie. Stevie was four weeks when Melbourne went into its first lockdown. And Melbourne has had the most amount of lockdowns through COVID. So that did something, again, I didn't realise until, I guess you don't realise the effect of it until after a couple of years. But that, and so I was working from home. And then we had to move house in between the first and the second lockdown because the landlord wanted to sell and there's just all sorts of stress and Chris my husband's had some personal family stress as well yeah it's been extremely hard to go from because like I said I have no issue in front of a room of 100 people because that's where I draw the energy from so I've really struggled especially mentally having to work from home all the time and not have any interactions with other people I don't get that feedback so then I don't feel Like even when you take an order, you make it and you give it to someone, they'll tell you whether they love it or not. And that's the feedback that that keeps you going. I put out a course and people would email me, they would send me comments and stuff, but it's really hard to try and draw the energy from that. You don't feel it. 
and work from home. My husband works from home, so like we're always there seeing each other. And yeah, so I'm not going to lie, it's been extremely difficult. So we're moving house again this year in the middle of the year. So my plan is to <laughs> move my office out of the house. <laughs> you know, I've had the crazy meeting people all the time, flying all over the world, like juggling so many things. And I know that's not sustainable, but I've also now experienced working from home, not seeing anyone. Like I have a team of four or five people, but none of them are in Melbourne. Like one's in Canada, one's in Brisbane. Actually, the advertising agency is in Melbourne, but I've never met them yeah. in person. Like we've always just done Zoom. And it's, yeah, it's not my person. My husband loves going to his hole. He's fine. He's been like that his whole life. But I really struggle. And I've only just learned that after having gone through this. Like, I really need that interpersonal, yeah. the real energy. Like, even just speaking to you guys yeah, and sure. seeing your face is better than emailing. Or, But if I had a drink with you now in your living room, I'd go off the charts because that energy... Yeah, if we were recording this in person, it would be really just right. something else. It's true. Yeah. You've experienced both extremes. You've gone oh, yeah. from very hectic to totally isolated. And that point of being totally isolated, I just think for me, not as the baker here in this partnership, is fascinating because most bakers live a very isolated type of job baking in their kitchens. And like you say, the only real feedback you're getting is that handover and a couple of messages or a call back or a repeat order from someone saying, oh my God, the cake was just amazing and all this. But there's hours and hours in the day where no one's helping you, checking on what you're doing or checking in on you, on your mental health to make sure you're keeping up. It's really, really tough. It's a very, very hard industry to stick it out yeah. and get through. And that's why we love talking to all these people who've made something of it because you all impart so much knowledge. And we you know we just learned that, okay, we, I'm learning from you here. You can wing it to a point, yeah. but you can't wing it the whole time. Yeah. And you grow up as you do it. So you're, you've grown up as your business has matured, you've matured with it to now completely change what it is versus what it was five years ago, which is fascinating because you would never known that we were going to go through this process. No one was probably ever going to tell you we're going to go through this process. You just went out and did it and then realized as you went through it, I've got to change this. I've got to do that. I've got to pick up here. I've got to do that. I've got to stop this. That's the big one. I have to stop doing this now so I can focus on this other part because that's the part that really seems to be going somewhere. You don't know that when you start. Yeah. So many things we've learned running our business. And that's the fascinating part of it. So that's what I like hearing and understanding from you, because you are, even though it sounds like a massive struggle and it has been, there's so much that you take, we take out of that, that you learn. I think in, in hindsight, because I've reflected on it, I might make it sound like it's not a good thing, but it was amazing being able to do all those things. Even when I was struggling, I was really enjoying it. It's only because I couldn't cope with all of them at once yeah. that I had to let them go. And I guess my ability to just let things go then allowed me to pivot so many times so that I could still have a business now. Yeah. Whereas most people would just still try and push the cake or the cafe or they'll just shut it and then go and find a job. I guess it was fun. It was really fun. I, I just think how wherever you decide to go next or however you decide to build a business, you've had that incredible experience of growing something significantly. And I think this is like the entrepreneur's journey as well, that you don't know what you don't know, right? So yeah. you were growing and growing and juggling the best that you could based on your personality type and et cetera, et cetera. If you were to do it again, you would do it so much different, so much more differently, but that's only because of all the mistakes of all the things that you did wrong and all the things that also but did and, right. And then it might not be fun <laughs> if you did it properly. So I guess <laughs> you just do what you think is best at the time, I guess, and you learn from it. And that's always been my motto, I guess. Uh, I don't regret things. What's interesting to me is, so part, we manufacture in Vietnam, okay? So we're over there fairly often. And we see the people, the amazing people, and we see what they do. And it seems almost everyone there wants to be some kind of an entrepreneur. I mean, they're making a business out of nothing. They've got, you know, a square foot or a square meter of space outside a corner somewhere. And there's a business that they popped up from that like at a very, very early start. And even though 
most of your life has not been there and you haven't even been around most of your family, there's still that entrepreneurial spirit and drive that's come in to you as a person that just forces you to push through and create these new boundaries. And on top of that, question the existing things that are out there and reevaluate those to say, does it have to be done that way? Can we do it in another way? So you commonly post about, for example, here's a great example. How much buttercream do you really need? I don't think I've seen anyone ever ask that question. And it's one of those things where I would look at that and go, that's a really good point because I'm quite technical and analytical. Before I go make it, I go and study and figure out, okay, how much exactly do I need then? If I'm going to make X, (laughs) I'd have a whole spreadsheet. And in contrast to that, I would wing it. (laughs) So true. (laughs) I did both. So now, you know, now I know what to recommend. But yeah, that's interesting about the Vietnamese people. But I think in Asia in general, working in an office is a privilege because not everyone gets to go to school. No, you're right. You've got to make a living somehow. So they don't see it as being entrepreneurial or even having a business. It's just making a living. Yeah, it's a way of life. Because I've had, I have such an extensive family here, cousins and all sorts, and I've seen so many of them change jobs or change business. Even my parents, they'd sell food and then if that dish doesn't work, then they'll switch to selling another dish. but that then becomes a different restaurant because, as you might know, they usually just sell one dish yeah, and they specialise in one dish. But, yeah, like, that's interesting. Like, it's never been, I don't think for the average person, they think that they're a business owner. To them, they're just trying to... They're just trying to make their way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's very true. I guess that is the spirit that I picked up because I never really thought now when I've been looking at my business properly and trying to learn how to run and grow a business properly, I would probably identify as an entrepreneur now. But when I opened the cafe, that was just like, how do I make a living not having to work for someone and doing something that I could do? And I think that's most of even my students' mindset. People don't need to make a lot of money. They just want to make a few cakes and make a few hundred dollars so that they can spend the rest of the time with their kids. Or Yeah, a, bit, a little balance and quality of life. Yeah, and have a creative outlet. So feel like you've actually achieved something or done something during the day. Without burning out. Yeah. <laughs> that burning out thing I still don't get because when I was teaching and so many people would say, oh, I bake when my kids are asleep. And I think I have a funny reel on this as well. I'm like, when do you sleep? Yeah. Because when the kids go to bed and then people would bake until 2 o'clock in the morning and then, you know, you get up and... Yeah, it's crazy how people still stick to this craft even through all these. I think it's also just having a grasp on normality because I think when you're in the midst of like children or there's two children, three children, it's feeling like you've done something for yourself amongst all the other stuff of like cooking, cleaning, all the chores and to and fro and drop them at school, nursery. I think we talked about with Jenny as well from Posh Cakes. It was just having some kind of thing that I've achieved something today. I haven't just done all the housework and been a mom or a dad or I feel like I've actually done something. So I think that's the attractiveness of of baking is that you feel like you've done something. Yeah, so what my struggle has been is since I stopped taking cake orders, then I stopped having that satisfaction from making a cake. Like you said, I've done something, even though I've done so many other things with my business and stuff. So that's what I really struggle with is finding what do I want to do, actually. I had this conversation with my husband just before because I've always just acted instinctively. But right now, I'm actually at a loss as to what it is. And I'm not used to it because I always had something that would guide me that I would just go for it. And the last two years, I've really stopped in one spot and set up my business properly. And you see a lot of, we pump out a lot of content, but there's a system behind even the content creation and stuff. So it's like the cake systems that I put, like that I teach, which is learned through my years of making the mistakes of winging it. I've been doing the same with my business in the last two years. But I haven't gotten that satisfaction from actually making something, being able to get that feedback straight away. And because I'm not teaching in person, I'm just doing all this thing behind the computer. 
And the reason why I opened the cafe is because I didn't want to be in, in behind the computer. <laughs> I'm at a point where I really question. Maybe you need to reintegrate something creative for yourself. Yeah. The future is there for you because now you've, as you focus your business, your brand has built more, your awareness has built more. That may allow you to circle back to opening up something that allows that creativity to happen. And it can be absolutely anything from obviously a little weekend only appointment only cake shop to an annual don't tell Charles conference for bakers. I don't know, right? I'm just throwing ideas out. But the idea Too is... Too many ideas, actually, and I don't know which one to go with. Being on holiday doesn't help either because your brain is just going to like think, oh, what can I do? <laughs> well, I think what I'm more interested in now, which I haven't really gained clarity on, when I was teaching people how to make cakes, there was hardly anyone. You know, and if you want to learn how to make a buttercream cake, then just take my course and you'll be right. But the scene is full of cakers who've transitioned from that into this spot where, again, there's no guidance here. And there's no, like you said, there's no support here. So I'm more interested in like, how do I add to this part of the community? Because there's way too many, it's saturated with people trying to teach people how to make cake now. And there's so many amazing cake artists and the bar's really... So I don't feel like I could add much more to that space, even though I have courses and products that do that. But for me, in terms of my purpose, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Like, how do I support people who've moved on from that to this point now where they've actually got some kind of skills? How do I support them in terms of whether they want to run a business or whether they want to continue to do it as a hobby or like a bit of both? It's the sustain phase, right? So it's like, how do you keep people in it? And you going on this journey is amazing. And I've got so many ideas of like how you, what you could do next. (laughs) But I'd love to hear that. Which which may give you like your passion, right? That you're just even just setting up. So you could have FaceTimes or one-to-one or group classes, uh, people coming in and teaching them this content because it doesn't necessarily have to all be online. You could do FaceTimes, you could do group virtual classes of Q&As, or it could actually be group classes in Melbourne. So you still get that personal contact, but you're, because not everyone's so good at taking that on board on an online content and absorbing it. Like we were all different types of learners. So you might want to tailor that. So you still get lots of enjoyment of doing the face-to-face, whether it's online or in class workshops, or it could be like half was saying that annual, don't tell Charles. The thing is, Rachel, as you're alluding to, like she builds her own little community. Yeah. In-person community. She's built an online community, but an in-person community. Because a lot of people are very loyal, right? And they stick to people they like working with and they like learning from. And you've got a big enough following there where they can pick up so much interesting information from you in the style of how you've brought it. And that's where you differentiate and set yourself apart. But we could go on and on (laughs) for this. We're already over an hour. Tell you what, listen, we have to wrap up with a couple of interesting things. We generally end our podcast with a little quick fire question round. And it's just the first thing that comes to mind. You can answer or you can explain it or you don't have to. So I'm going to go first. And my question is, American buttercream or Swiss meringue buttercream? Don't tell Charles buttercreams. (laughs) (laughs) Perfect. I have to rewrite my question now. Brilliant, brilliant. All right. One aspect of baking you won't compromise on. The ingredients. I always say don't cheap out on ingredients, cheap out on your time. So I would say ingredients. Excellent. What a great quote. Okay, a baking book from your bookshelf. Oh, I haven't had one. This one's called On Baking. Ah, okay. By Eddie Van Dam. So he's an actual, he's a French pastry chef. And it's got a lot of fundamentals on not baking cakes, but that's what they teach patissiers and yeah. Excellent. Well, I'm going to have a look into Yeah, that. definitely. Who would you want to make your next birthday cake? My husband. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Have you guys been following that one? Yeah. No. Yeah. So he makes, so Christo bakes, Stevie turns three on Thursday. Okay. So we're going to miss her annual Christo bake. But so many people have messaged me and go, oh my God, there's something we're going to miss it. So we might have to do it in March. 
Brilliant. But yeah, he makes my birthday cakes and Stevie birthday cakes. <laughs> That's so cool. That's so cool. All right, listen, Dal, thank you so much. It's been really, really good to chat with you. And I just want to say thanks so much for opening up and giving us a real window and insight into your brain and your mind and what you've been through. It's been really, really powerful for us. So we really appreciate it. So thank you. Thanks for having me. It's just nice to have someone in who understands what I'm talking about <laughs> instead of just my husband. So I really, yeah, I really enjoy chatting with you guys. And we had a chat before this a while ago as well. But yeah, it's really nice to have people in the industry that I can chat to. So thanks for having me. Fantastic. We'll let you get back to the pool. <laughs> And that is episode 15 of My Baking Journey. Tao is in the show notes. You can follow her there. You can check out her website, The Cake School, and learn everything you wanted to know. We really thank her for being in this week's episode. Listen, your favorite podcast app, Spotify, maybe it's Apple Podcasts. There's a little button in there. It says subscribe or it says follow. Just make sure you hit that so that we know you're getting the latest episode as soon as possible and you can listen to it at your leisure. We hope you really enjoyed this week. We're back next week. And don't forget, this podcast is brought to you by Olva, packaging for bakers designed by a baker. How about that? Check us out at www.olva.shop. Bye-bye.